Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. It's a story that would go on to change the world, but it happened so long ago that we forget. You know, the same way you can forget what you got last Christmas. And yet here we are, the same thing year after year. We decorate, we rush, we shop, we wrap, we open, we invite, we attend, we eat, we celebrate, we box it all up, wait 12 months, and we do it again. But there's more to the story, more than a tree, more than gifts, and more than just another holiday. And we all want there to be more to this season. The thing is, God knew that. In fact, that was his plan all along. He wants us to have more, more joy, more peace, more of Him. He gave us the perfect gift, and it wasn't wrapped neatly under a tree. The gift He gave wasn't a virgin mother or wise men. It wasn't angels, a star, or a manger. The gift He gave was and is the person of Jesus, fully God but completely human. The gift was that He clothed Himself in humanity and embarked on a rescue mission one that would give hope to all mankind. And the story that would change the world forever began like this. Shh, don't wake the baby, right? <laughs> That's what that reminds me of when I hear that ending piece. Well, welcome, I'm glad that you're here this morning as we continue in our Christmas series. Uh, God's gift for you. And uh, today, before I jump in and we unpackage the gift of peace that God has given to us, I just want to uh, take care of some family business. Uh, so I want to give you some updates. So if you're new with us this morning, just have patience with me. I'll get to the message in a moment, okay? First, uh, Pastor Andy sends his love to you guys. Uh, he misses you terribly. It's very hard for him to be away, especially on uh, Sunday mornings like this. But uh, his knee reconstructed surgery and his PT, that's all gone really well, just very slow for him, right? Uh, but he's doing well, and he's really working hard so that he can be with you on Christmas Eve services, all three of those services to share with you. So please keep him in prayer that he can actually do that, okay? Now, uh, next I want to talk to you about a couple of weeks ago, I challenged you to participate in paying off the remaining balance uh, that the church had for its renovation project. You guys remember that? Uh, now, some of you remember when we first came into the uh, facility that it was nothing more than an, uh, a wreckable facility, right? It was kind of torn down and it really needed to be renovated for us to be able to use it. And so uh, what we did is we took pledges and we had $3.2 million actually pledged to this reconstruction project, which was marvelous and great. And a lot of that was fulfilled, uh, but with, with people moving and then with economic roller coaster, it didn't quite uh, get that uh, pledge completed. And so the church finds itself in $159,000 uh, that is due to finish that loan payment off on January 5th. 2017, which is just a couple of weeks away, right? And so we invited every one of you to do a one-time offer to help us to reach that goal. And as you heard Daniel say that we had $28,500 like given, right, uh, these past couple of weeks, which is fantastic. I'm very happy about that. And uh, last week, we even received a one-time gift, you know, when I gave you that giving, uh, giving plan, right? Uh, when I gave that to you a couple of weeks ago, that top gift was 25000 and we all looked and went, whoa, well, somebody sold off some stock and gave that to the church. Isn't that cool? So that helped take care of that top rung. But really, to participate, uh, to accomplish our goal, it takes everybody to participate. That's the way God has always worked with the vineyard. It's not like just one you know, wealthy person takes care of everything. He likes to involve all of us. And so I want to encourage every one of you to come along and to help the best you can in that, in that plan, uh, and to be part of the story here at Vineyard, what God is doing, you know, to be able to help 
vineyard accomplish its purpose to, to be that contemporary extension of the good news to Jesus Christ and to help people find and fulfill God's calling, right? Well, that purpose is played out in this building often, like we saw when we had, how, you know, how's the thousand youth in here a couple of weeks ago, right? With 50 of them coming to make a decision for Christ. The building is important and not to be heavy laden with burdens of, of repayment of debt and stuff like that. So I put all that before you as the church family so that you're aware. Now your job is just to pray and to see what God would have you to do. Okay? Very good. All right, so let me jump into today's message. I'm very excited about this message, right? So what I want to open up for you today is this gift that God gives us, this gift of peace. And I want to talk about how we can unwrap it better. So why don't you bow your heads, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to continue to come. Father, I ask that you would wake us up in the name of Jesus, that you would cause us to be attentive to what it is that your Spirit is saying, Father. And I bind the enemy that would bring in any kind of cloudiness or confusion, Lord, that would, yeah, that would distract us from what it is that you want to say. And so, Holy Spirit, we need you. I need you. I need you to come in all your power and your might, and I need you to break in, Lord Jesus, into the hearts and the minds of those that have come and poised themselves to hear what you had to say. So, Father, would you come and answer? Yes, I hear that you are coming. You are answering. Thank you, Father, for being amongst us, moving amongst us. Now, Lord, come and, and just lighten everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, first thing I want to ask you guys to do is to play an imaginary game with me, okay? I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine a holiday in honor of the birth of the Savior of the world, the Prince of Peace, right? The place at this holiday is going to be where we worship this man as a divine figure. Everybody's doing it, right? And the holiday is where all the people are coming together with their families and friends and eating and drinking, and this holiday that you're imagining is going to permeate all our shopping centers and our public spaces, right? And so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, she's talking about our Christmas celebration, you know, in 2016. Well, not so. You see, such a holiday that I described already was in existence at the time of Jesus of Nazareth's birth in Bethlehem. There was already a culture-wide annual holiday that was taking place uh, to celebrate the birth of the Savior of the world, right? And as you guessed, the Savior of the world was not Jesus Christ, but yet it was pronounced as the Roman Empire Emperor Caesar. That's what they were celebrating. The fact that Rome had conquered everyone and that they were celebrating that the emperor was the Prince of Peace, right? that he, he was the savior of the world, that he brought peace and prosperity. And this is where we see this, this scripture, the backdrop of this scripture that comes in when we read it at Christmas in Luke 2, 14, where the angels come to the shepherds and they say, glory to God in the highest in heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. And so what we see here is that there's this announcing by the angels and breaking in. The kingdom of God now is breaking into the earth, and he's saying, hey, here's a new type of peace that I want to share with you. And it's going to go in contradiction to the peace of the present day that you have experienced under the Roman rule. Now, architects have studied, you know, who study the human history, they found these coins, these Roman coins everywhere, right? And on these coins, one side has a head of the goddess Pox. And so that, that means the peace, uh, the god of peace. So on one side, their coin had Pox, and on the other side, it had Augustus, Caesar Augustus, and he was in his military garb, and he had a spear. And so literally, then, this coin was showing the world how they were going to rule with the promise of peace through, you flip that coin over, through conquest. That's what the Roman Empire was offering. Now, the Roman Empire did indeed conquer a large part of the world. And they went through all the Mediterranean cities, conquering, you know, city after city, right? People after people. And they did their conquests in a very bloody, a very brutal way, especially to anybody who tried to resist them. 
You see, the principal tactic of the Roman, Roman soldiers was not just to conquer a city, but it was to enslave the able-bodied people, right? And then they would, they would uh, crucify those that they projected as being rebels. So they put hundreds of them and they would crucify them. And so the empire was ruling with terrorism. They were, you know, terrorizing the population to be in submission. And there was nowhere on earth that this was felt more keenly, this Roman style of peace felt more than in the promised land in the 21st century here, or in the first century here, because what was happening is the Jewish people were revolting. They were pushing back against this, uh, this conquest that was coming to them. And this is the backdrop that our scriptures we read about at Christmas comes through. Even the scripture that Isaiah prophesied 700 years earlier about the coming of the Prince of Peace drops in here. Look on your outline. The Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, circle that, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will gain, reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So again, the scripture is saying, hey, we're breaking in here, right? The kingdom of God is going to break in here into this culture, into this time. And we are going, you know, the God opens up and says, here's the Messiah, here is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And this peace that he's offering us, this Prince of Peace, is going to be radically at odds with the culture. And isn't that not true of God's peace even today? That it is at odds with what the culture says is peace. The only true peace, the only true Prince of Peace is Jesus Christ. Now here's another thought on your outline. A primary reason that Jesus came to earth was to bring us peace, right? Jesus came into the world to bring peace. That was the key aspect of his mission here, was to bring us peace. You see this in the two scriptures that the Apostle Paul writes about Jesus' purpose in Ephesians. Look at this with me. Ephesians 2, 17. He, which is Jesus, came and preached peace to you, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. And then the next scripture in Ephesians 2.14, it says, For he himself is our peace, speaking of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, is pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ's mission is to come and to be the peacemaker of this world, to be the peacemaker between us and a holy God, right? Mankind and a holy God. Jesus Christ himself even says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives you, right? That backdrop of peace again. He says, that's not the kind of peace. And then because of that, Jesus says this, therefore, right, do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid, if you're sitting in here today and you're troubled and you're afraid, right? You're fearful of things that are going on around you and you're seeking peace, you run to Jesus because that's why he came. That's why he came. Now on your outline it says, why? Why is this message of peace through Jesus so significant to you and I? Why is it so significant? Well, guys, the world we live in is in full of turmoil. Wouldn't you agree? You can't cut on that TV without all kinds of, 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 of junk coming at you, not just politically, but the attacks of terror that is happening on a consistent basis. And it's not just out in the world, it's in the United States, right? You know, according to the United Nation, there are at least 10 wars going on right now around the world. And there are a half dozen you know, major conflicts that are going on, and people are being killed by the thousands everywhere in the world, right? There's so much unrest. And even at this time, I think about our own community and the world affairs because it feels so sometimes so distant, distant, yet 
at this time at Christmas, I am always reminded of a member. His name was Sam Griffin. He came here and was a very much a, him and his family were very much a, a part of our church. And he was sent to Afghanistan to keep peace. And they shot him in the head and they killed him. And he left behind a beautiful wife and two beautiful, beautiful little boys. See, you cannot escape the darkness of the world. It pushes in, pushes in. And even when we drill down and we look at our own selves, right? I can tell you my counseling load goes up tremendously during the holidays, right? It goes up because people seem to have a hard time coping during this time, a very hard time. You know, I think about Thanksgiving that we just went through, right? Where we gathered with all our friends and our family and, and uh, we had lots of, of uh, peace, you know, people around us. And for many people, this is anything but peaceful, <laughs> a peaceful time, right? Where they go and they spent time with the family and, and it was there that they, they had to, in, you know, encounter again those extra grace required people, <laughs> if you know what I mean, the crazy eddies that you go, whoa, after a couple of days, you're like, get me out of here, right? <laughs> right? And it, it, and it robs your peace. And, and then I think about all our blended families and how as you walk into that, there's that familiar pull between two families you love and making sure you ride the line in the middle so you don't favor one over the other. So stressful. And then I think about marriage relationships that are not really strong. And when they add the, uh, the weight of a holiday, it seems to increase the marital disharmony, right, that goes on in the family. You see, so many people struggle to deal with the hurts of family members, with the long outstanding grudges uh, with ex-spouses or ex-girlfriends or boyfriends. You know, they really struggle with those to, to be able to deal with the verbal things that have been said to them, the put-downs. And they think to themselves, peace, peace on earth, peace in here, it seems to be elusive. I don't seem to be able to get it. There's this story of a well-known Christian lady. Her name is Becky Peapot, and she's a writer, a Christian writer, and she writes an interesting observation about a class that she took at Harvard once, and this class was a class that had to do with psychotherapy. So she went into it, uh, she wanted to learn about that subject matter, and so as she sat there, the professor was discussing a case of how psychotherapy would help people, you know, patients to discover certain things and how it had helped this in this one case, a lady discovered the fact that she really had a lot of hostility and anger towards her mother. Well, Becky raises her hands in the class and she asks the professor, you know, okay, so I get it. So this person, this patient, let's say they come back to you and they go, hey, I get it. I get it, I, I now can see that, that I did have this underlying hatred and anger toward my mom and that it fueled all my addictive behaviors, right? I get it, but now could you help me to know how to forgive her? Can you help me to know how to forgive her? And Becky asked the question, so how is psychotherapy going to assist this patient in being able to forgive? And then the professor nodded and said, well, hmm, we have to help the patients learn to live with it. And hopefully they won't, that won't drive them anymore. We just want them to recognize it. But we cannot help them to forgive. And I thought, oh, man. And as I was reading this, Becky says the class, all the hands shot up asking about, well, then how are we going to get to this place of forgiveness? Is that not the place you want us to, to arrive with a person and the professor, he got kind of testy, and he says this, if you guys are looking for a changed heart, you are looking in the wrong department. Psychotherapy can help you identify and understand your hatred, but it can never help you to forgive. Whoa. So how do you and I gain the power to forgive someone, someone who has deeply hurt us, that continuously offends us, that hurt us so deep that it caused us to withdraw and not to be able to trust or to love the people around us? How do we forgive people that have sinned against us and that has just radically altered our life because there's so much pain there? How do we gain the ability to forgive? You see, I believe the professor was right that psychotherapy can help you to identify that's what's going on, especially driving addictions, 
However, it doesn't have the power to give you to forgive. That, my friends, is going to require a spiritual encounter that must take place in your life. It must take place. In order to be able to have peace with other people that have hurt you deeply, you have to be able to understand and discover and walk out the peace that God offers us through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, the apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with him. So listen, when I find as a Christ follower that I am up against the wall and I am faced with not having the peace enough in myself to forgive, that is a sign to me that all I'm doing is trying to move in my own strength. And of my own accord, I can do nothing, absolutely nothing. You see, it's only through recognizing what he has done that gives me the power and moving within that power can I then offer forgiveness? That's the only way it works. It does not work any other way. We are not strong enough. We're not strong enough. So this message of peace is so significant. Sure, Sharon, I get it, but how do I walk that out in a daily basis, right? How do I walk that out? Well, my friends, you got to have a per, you know, perspective change here. You just got to change your perspective on a few things. Go with me on this. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, it says, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailed it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. And so what I want you to see here, I'm going to break it down a little bit because this is so vitally important. I want you to show you the perspective. This is the perspective that God wants us to have. He wants us to know that it was Jesus who forgave our sins, that he canceled the debt of this legal indebtedness, our wrongs. He canceled those that were standing against you and I that were causing us to be condemned before a holy God. Jesus took our indebtedness. He took it. And, and, and we can read that, but I have to ask myself, do you really understand this? Do you understand what it's saying? Because when I talk to people, often I will hear them say, I get it, Sharon. I'm a sinner. Sure, I get it, you know, but I'm not that bad, <laughs> right? And it's almost like they have this, this, uh, this continuum of what, you know, what constitutes good and badness. And, and like the top rung, maybe that's like, Mother Teresa or Billy Graham or something, and on the bottom is your serial killers, right? And so they find themselves somewhere in between and say, oh, I'm really great here, in the middle, in the mean, I'm not that bad, right? And so they, they tend to say this, but yet we need a perspective change here because all humanity is under obligation to obey God, Billy Graham and the serial killer and you, we're all responsible for the law that God has set between, you know, before us. And he made it very clear because he gave us the Ten Commandments. Flip your um, outline over and we'll read those Ten Commandments quickly so that you can be reminded, right? The first one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any idols. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You keep the Sabbath. You honor your mother and father. You shall not murder, commit adultery. You shall not steal or you shall not lie. You shall not cover it, right? These are all guidelines that God says that we need to be participating in. And least you think, huh, I got those covered. When Jesus Christ came to earth, he revealed the spirit behind the law that I just read, right? He did that when he gave us the Sermon on the Mount. When he gave us that sermon, what Jesus did is he opened up the heart of God's commandments to us. He says it is not enough just to not, you know, give, to give your body, not to give your body to somebody other than your spouse. He says, no, if you lust mentally after somebody, you break the law. Or he says the commandment about murder, right? It wasn't just to keep us from grabbing a gun and shooting somebody and taking somebody's life. Jesus says that the heart of the matter is that God prohibits us, listen, God prohibits us from hating another human being, right? From writing them off, right? From writing them off. 
He says he prohibits that. Have you ever written somebody off? Said, ah, I'm done with you. I don't want any more things to do with you. Have you ever said that? Have you ever murdered somebody with the way you verbally tore them apart? Have you ever said to somebody, you know, words that you knew that would just shred them to bits because you were so angry? I can go on and on with the list of the Ten Commandments, and I can show you how each and every one of us has fallen short of those commandments, of those things that God asks us to do to obey the law, right? And if we haven't done it by the letter of the law, we do it by the spirit of the law. And all of us, all of us have missed it, right? And we're all under tremendous debt of obligation to the holy God. And me, I am at the front of that line, okay? I'm at the front of that line. I have missed it over and over again. And I can tell you guys, no matter how hard we try we can never pay off the debt that we owe God. We can never do it. We can't. And I tell you, this is the biggest trap that I see in, in organized religions around the world, right? I see people doing various rituals, <laughs> religious rituals, and they're trying to like answer this indebtedness that they feel down in their soul. They're trying to answer it. You know, by what if I go to a church or what if I go to a mosque? What if, you know, what if I go to a synagogue, right? If I can just do the confession, if I can just be baptized, then I will pay for my indebtedness. But listen, the Bible says that we are so indebted that we could never, ever pay the debt, that we were utterly bankrupt and without hope, without hope. And that, my friends, is what makes the good news so very good. Because our God saw and through his grace, he acted through Jesus Christ to take care of our indebtedness and to bring us peace with himself through Jesus Christ. So how did Jesus do this exactly then? In verse 14, it's because he, Jesus, took away our sins by nailing it to a cross. He nailed it to a cross. That's how he did it, right? You know, in the ancient world, when you had a prisoner that was being crucified by the Roman government, the charges that they leveled against that prisoner, well, what they did is they wrote it on a sign, a placard, and then they took the charges and they would write murderer or thief or liar or rebel, and then they would nail it above the uh, person being crucified, right? And if you remember and recall, that's what happened with Jesus. When he was crucified on his cross, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Do you remember that sign? It was, over, it was over Jesus as he hung there and died. But I read, and as I read, I see the Apostle Paul saying to us in these scriptures that I have been reading to you, that the sign that hung over Jesus Christ was not just this, uh, this uh, sign that we read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but there was a spiritual sign that went behind it, a spiritual sign that, that accounted for every person's sins. You know, this spiritual sign, a placard that was there that said, I'm dying for the adulteress, for the fornicator, for the pornography user, for the haters. I'm dying here for those people that have fallen short, right, of the glory of God, that are gossiping, that are lying. And so they have this sign. And whether that be so in, in theory, like, oh, yeah, yeah, let me bring it down to put it right in front of you, guys. Let me, let me just bring it right down. Picture in your mind's eye a sign listing all of your sins, all of your shortcomings. You know, as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a friend, as a son or as a daughter. Think about all the places that you've failed. Think about a sign that has all of those things written on it. And then that sign is taken and it is nailed at the top of the cross and it hangs over a dying Christ who dies for those sins. Listen, guys, when you get this, when you really get this in your heart, I don't know about you, but it makes me want to just fall down on my knees and wants me to just holler out to my God and my Savior, see who has been forgiven much, loves much. And it's out of that perspective that comes the ability to forgive no matter what has happened to me in my life. 
I can forgive because I recognize how much I have been forgiven. Perspective. The perspective change here. When we understand that the message of Jesus Christ is so very significant, it helps to propel us forward. It propels us forward. Now, this last thought that I had that I wrote on your, your outline today is peace was achieved at the cross. I want to talk about that for a minute. And I'm going to go back to this Colossians 2.15 uh, scripture that we were looking at because this last part is very intriguing to me. It says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so what we see here is unlike the Roman Empire of that time, Jesus didn't achieve peace by conquering people. Rather, Jesus conquered Satan. And he conquered the dark forces that were about and that were aiming to pull human, humanity and human beings and you and me down. And so, so Jesus has never had war with us. His war is not with us. It was never with us. He has always been on your side. He has always advocated for you. And he leads from the cross and he leads with love and with forgiveness. It says, Isaiah 53 says here, But the coming Messiah was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Guys, how do we experience this gift of peace that God gives us? Well, we go after it by understanding that we must enact it and choose to follow his teaching, choose to have that perspective change that I'm talking about. Now, I want to finish with this, this series of John verses here to show you something. In John 1, 11, it says this, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. I'm going to stop there. What does that mean? That means Jesus Christ came to his own people, to his own na na uh, nation. He came to his own community. He came to his own family, and they didn't receive him. And I believe that still goes on today. I believe that he comes to us. You see, there are many of us who we have been around the truth. We have listened to it from, you know, from going to church as a Sunday school, you know, as a kid in Sunday school. We listened to it from our parents. We've heard it from our friends. We've been around the truth. We've been around it, and we know what Christ has done. Yet, we've not received it. We've not allowed it to be taken in, and we're not living it out, right? We're not following it. And is that not what it means that he came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him? Is that what's happening? I believe there are people in here today that that's true of. And in John 1.12, it says, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, Jesus Christ came so that you and I could have that title and be called children of God. It doesn't belong to everybody. You know, everybody is created by God, but not everybody is God's child. This is a wonderful title that when we understand what Christ has done for us, that we can become the daughter of the God Most High or the son of the God Most High. This is the title that he wants to give. See, the Bible says it doesn't just automatically happen. You have to do something to be adopted into God's family. How do I know this? Because look what it says about being a child of God here. This last scripture, John 1, 13, it says this, Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, as a husband's will, but born of God. And so what we see is a child of God is not made by human planning or by human engineering or by human material, but rather by the will of God. You're not just born into God's family, right? And you can't get there by your own plans and by trying to be better. Rather, it is a spiritual birth that God himself orchestrates. And this new birth is nothing short of a miracle. It's a miracle that God does in our hearts. 
And all we have to do is to be able to receive it. Like if someone would give you a gift and you receive it. You receive what Christ has done for you. You accept him as your savior. You understand the fact that you've asked him to be the leader of your life, right? That he paid that price for you on the cross, that he loves you that much. When we begin to understand that, what happens is there's a birth and we become children of the God most high. We become children of his. Now, some of you might not have ever made that decision to follow Jesus. And today, I'm going to end in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. And I encourage you to to voice that, because the scripture says, those that believe in their heart and they confess with their mouth, then so shall they be saved. It's that acting on what you know to be true back here. You need to act on it. And those of you who know this story, right, Jesus is coming to you again. Do not reject him. Come home. Come home and sit at his feet. You are meant to be a child of the God most high. And you and I must learn how to to understand that and to walk in that fullness. And we do that every time we open up the word of God. Every time we look at it and we challenge ourselves to not be conformed to this word, but to be renewed, you know, by the word of God. It's there that we begin to understand the power that comes up and out of us to be able to open up this gift of peace that God has given us for our life's journey. And that's my prayer, that this Christmas when you're walking through the holiday and and your peace is going to be ripped away from you, that you just stop and say, no, Christ has given me the gift of peace and I'm going to choose to open it up and call upon the Holy Spirit to give me the power to walk it out in my reality. Now, bow your heads with me and I'm going to pray for this message. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you were moving amongst us today, Lord God. I thank you for this love message, Lord. I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son here for us. And that you saw me in my own filth and my rags and all the the crap that I do, Lord. And you still gave me your son, Jesus. No greater love has ever been given to me or to anyone else. And say, Father God, I ask that this love message, that those that had ears to hear what you were saying, Lord, would be able to respond to it. And for those of you that are here today and you don't have any idea and you're going, oh man, I'm blown away. Listen, as everybody's head is bowed and they're praying and talking to the God themselves and getting that perspective change, I want to talk to you for a moment. Listen, you need to come to Jesus Christ and you need to be able to verbalize it. It doesn't matter about people around you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything, but I'm going to lead you in a prayer if you want that to pray right now, right where you're at. It makes all the difference in the world. You just say, Father God, go ahead, just say, go, Father God, I want what she's talking about. I want salvation. And so I acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And now I ask Jesus that you would forgive me. Forgive me. And I thank you now that you have taken that and you have forgiven me. And I ask you to be the leader of my life, the CEO. The best way I know, I'm reaching out to you today. Yes, Father. Lord, for those that were praying that prayer, I just ask that you'd seal it in their heart, Lord God. And this day, Father, I thank you that your word promises that you've written their name in the book of life and that nothing can etch it out. Now, Father, you have moved on me with such passion, Lord, for this gift of peace. 
Father, I ask that, that you would move and that as I was speaking, Lord, the things that were coming up in people's hearts and minds, that you would help them, Father, to be able to lay them at your cross, Lord, and to leave them there, Father, but to never forgive, I mean, never to forget the forgiveness that they receive so that they can forgive. Only through you, Lord Jesus, do we dare forgive. Only through you can we forgive. Father, comfort the brokenhearted that are here today. Yes. Give them a hope, Lord Jesus. Give them the words of affirmation that you love them, that you care about them, that you, yes, that you do bring your healing. God says that through his stripes you are healed. So, Father, I ask again that your spirit would move upon those lord yes and i even ask father that you have begun a crushing process in some of the hearts that you would try to push away i've heard this i've heard this before i don't need it and god would say you need it you need it to walk you need it to walk so that the world can see through you the hope that i have for them that you can be successful and stand before me and hear, well done, good and faithful one. Oh, Father, may you move amongst your people so that they would see and feel you today. I thank you for your great love and your great mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at and we'll see you next week.